Very good. Welcome again to Via Voices, the weekly uh, interview with uh, people from along and across the U.S.-Mexico border. I'm John Fanestel, and today's uh, interview is with Victor Ochoa. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my friend and, and colleague, uh, Rigoberto Reyes, who is going to lead today's interview. Uh, Rigo, will you uh, introduce us to, uh, to your friend, uh, Victor Ochoa? Yes, definitely. Thank you, John. Thank you for this opportunity, and also thank you, Victor, for agreeing to, uh, to do this with us. Uh, Victor and I go back uh, probably close to 50 years of uh, friendship, friendship, activism, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, most people that are here from San Diego, uh, I know Victor doesn't need much of an introduction. Most everybody knows him, uh, not only because of his activism, but also because of his artistic skills. Uh, Victor, thank you again for agreeing to being here with us. Uh, one of the first questions that I have is in regards to you yourself as far as growing up. I understand you, you were born in Los Angeles. Uh, could you talk a, a little bit about that, about that growing, growing up as a, as a child, if you will? Well, you know, it's, it, I'm going to be 72 next month, Rigo. <laughs> so it, it's a little bit far. Don't remind me. Yeah, yo, yo. But, uh, you know, when I was born in 1948, um, it was during, right after the war, my, my dad was a pachuco and my, dad, my mother in a certain way also. So they had a undocumented type farm worker lifestyle living in the city. And I was actually born in South Central, which is not the South Central of today. In those times, there was more of an undocumented little motel looking housing and it was very different than, than it is now. And um, it was very unusual for me as a kid because my parents did not uh, want to teach me Spanish. They didn't want us to be looked on as Mexicans because they were both had uh, different kinds of IDs. I first knew my dad as, uh, uh, you know, last name was Placencia. And, uh, I asked my mom, I thought my dad was Victor Ochoa like me. And uh, and so she would always, hush, hush, don't, don't talk. So I was always like in this realm of, un, of undocumented uncertainty. And uh, my mother was very afraid of all these kind of GI looking guys that were in those years, uh, immigration look, they had uh, London fog, trench coats, big brim hats, big 45 sticking out of their sides. And um, I love going to school. So I think one of the things with me is that I just love going to school. I was really good in school most of my life. Um, and, um, you know, my dad just loved, he was an orphan. So he loved my sister and I so much. You know, I went to the first, first day Disneyland opened in 1955. That was the year that uh, immigration uh, caught up with us and got and kicked us back to Tijuana. And uh, I uh, remember, you know, being a, a U.S. citizen. And so I, and my English was fairly good. You know, I think that, uh, you know, uh, also very exciting to, to go to Tijuana because I remember asking my mom as we're going through Calle Primera because my grandmother lives in, in La Zona Norte. Uh, close to Panteon Numero Uno, we're going down first in those years. It looked like Hong Kong. Time I was in the back seat. I said, Mom, is this Hong Kong? You know, it, it, uh, but it was so interesting to me. It was like all these vendors and, and it, we had to go through Coahuila, which there's some street uh, prostitution in that, in that, on that street at that time. So, I mean, it, as a kid, it was very, very, uh, exciting and emotional until I got sick uh, eating the vegetables at the Mercado without washing, <laughs> you know, on a negative point. <laughs> so, so you grew up, you, uh, part of your life, you grew up in Tijuana then? Yeah, as uh, in 1955, when, when we went to, uh, to Tijuana, uh, I lived with my, my grandparents for um, a minute and my dad built some um, apartments um, that we moved into, a couple of them. And uh, 
he had already bought all the craftsman tools that you could buy for carpentry, everything you could think of, and he was storing them in a garage. He was pretty fed up of living in the United States because when you're undocumented, you always get the worst jobs possible, you know, always the most hazardous, poisonous. He used to work with uh, ammonias and different things at the Swift Meat Packing Company. And um, he was very tired. He was a, a, a truck driver for a long time. He started losing his sight and his kidneys started hardening uh, for so much driving. So he pretty much wanted to be independent. He, he really never really wanted to return back to the United States. So he, he got a truck from Tijuana. My grandfather uh, brought it up, um, loaded it up. We had a two, eight by 20 redwood trailer that was housing during World War II. And uh, my dad bought one. We actually lived in this eight by 20 redwood trailer, the whole bunch of us. So we drove it back behind the 49 Merck four door suicide doors, Rigo. Oh my and, uh, God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? La bomba yeah, the, yeah. of all true dramflistas. And uh, we drove uh, following that big truck and um, he started up his workshop uh, right away and uh, start making furniture and things like that, you know, um, as soon as we got there. Victor, uh, t tell us a little bit about your own development as, a, as, a, as an artist, especially when you were growing up and then discovering that skill that, uh, that uh, you're very well known for now. Yeah, you know, I, it, it's been a fabulous experience for me. I, I, I remember the first grade, well, actually before I even went to school at five, my mom was babysitting a whole bunch of kids there in the uh, they were drawing like stick figures in it. I remember I drew a guy with his leg crossed and a hat, smoking a cigarette. It was fashionable to smoke cigarettes in those years, even for women. Women were, were smoking really heavy duty. And, uh, and I had a little vest and a tie and on, on this character. And my, and my mom's going like, she thought it was kind of unusual because other kids were just doing these stick figures. But the first grade was the culminating ego experience for me because I, you know how you make lines outside the school and then you do the Pledge of Allegiance and then you go into the, the hallway. I had a, a piece of my work on the hallway and it was simply those uh, line papers that you write a story and see. the plane goes over the city in, in Los Angeles. I drew the City Hall of LA and then uh, a plane, and of course I'm in the window going high uh, to everybody. And uh, the teacher was impressed with it. She put it on the on the hallway, and uh, that really that's why as a teacher I always do that with kids. I always like boost their ego because here I am, almost 72, and I I, I remember that first grade. I I was always like that throughout my school. Um, I had the first markers in Tijuana. You believe it or not, we didn't have markers when I was a kid. So my teacher went to a conference in LA and he brought these big old markers that you unscrew the back and you fill them with ink and stuff. And so I was in charge of the bulletin board. So I I got to use markers for, before just about anybody in Tijuana. And uh, I, got, I won a prize citywide uh, in Municipio de Tijuana uh, on uh, dental hygiene. And that's the first time I competed citywide. And I did these cartoons of cavities, uh, like gangsters. And the superhero was a toothpaste guy with a big toothbrush. And uh, that was in the fifth grade. And um, so my mom, I have to remember her all the time because she said, do what you love to do and always be on time, always be 15 minutes ahead of time. And uh, so this whole time, even when I was 10 years old, I worked in a, in a, at, the sink, um, at a photography studio in Tijuana because I took a correspondence course for cartooning from the back of a comic book. And so it seemed like just about every job that I've had throughout my life has been related to the visual arts. 
and actually that's that's been your specialty yes it be, it's been my specialty and um until i i worked with the people at the centro cultural de la raza in san diego that was my first real experience working with all the other disciplines because we came together dancers uh, actors musicians poets all of the disciplines so Again, I had the great fortune of being influenced and in working with all of these kinds of artists. So I, I mean, I would with, with, work with Alulista, I worked with Chunky, I worked, you know, with all of these different kinds of artists. So in turn, that influenced me quite a bit. Now I, I like, I have a conga drum behind me there. And I, I like music. I, um, my son's a DJ. You know, you could tell that every computer has a, a woofer and uh, all kinds of speakers. So I, I, I love music in my cars. I have XM. I'm jamming everything from the 60s to jazz, salsa. I've been going to Cuba for the past 20 years. So I'm like, they call me Cubacano, oye. So I, <laughs> I, I, I've acquired that uh, Caribbean beat as well. Victor, uh, you are now throughout the years, uh, a renowned artist uh, uh, that uh, has traveled all over the world, you've, you've painted all over the world. Could you talk about that, about your own development as that, and also also about your activism as it relates to, uh, to Chicano Park? Well, I, uh, as soon as I hit like 19, I wanted to know, it, I, I have a, a very weird way of, I always liked darker, complected girls. I don't, I'm not sure where that came from. <clears throat> and uh, they would always say, oh, you're taller because you have a grandfather that's German. You have, you're lighter because you have a French grandfather. And I always kept on asking my grandparents, my parents, who's the Indian? And uh, <laughs> I, I finally met my great grandmother, who's a Zapoteca Indian, like four feet tall. And and I said, oh, there, and she spoke Zapoteca, and she made me this chocolate con molinillo when I was a kid. And, uh, and that al always was enthusiastic for me to know that. And, and uh, so as soon as I, I, I was 19, I had a little bit of money. I told my dad, I want to go see where the family is. So I started traveling. I've been to every state of Mexico, every state of the United States. I've driven across country to New York 20 times in a car. And uh, I've been all over Europe, uh, Japan, uh, China, um, Canada. I mean, it's, it's been, they, my mom was always nervous because I me decía vago, you know, you're, you're, you're going places. But my main intent was to meet people, even throughout the United States, I know muralists throughout the United States and in a lot of places in Mexico. And so I always uh, would communicate with them and then I would do a project on my way there or on my way through there. So being a mural painter, it always uh, was, was even a better contact. And even to this day, I still know those uh, artists throughout the United States and I actually stay Kind of like a hit, you stay at their pads as well. So it, um, you know, I think one of my lar largest uh, experiences as far as uh, dynamics with the uh, other country was with Ireland. And uh, I, I painted a mural right on Falls Road in Belfast. And they asked me to coordinate this with the IRA. And uh, I knew some something about the history of Ireland, but the groups were um, Leonard Peltier group of uh, people from the United States. ETA, the group from the, the Basque region of Spain were there. Um, so I had all these kind of subversive kind of uh, dynamic artists working with me. So that was like, here it is a Chicano uh, dealing with, with these other issues, which the mural was dedicated to Stephen Beekle from South Africa, who was murdered uh, 20 years before. And uh, his charisma on that actually was uh, part of getting Mandela out of prison as well as the 
ending of apartheid. And uh, I know the Mexican consulate in Dublin would come and visit. He couldn't sit. He couldn't imagine somebody from Tijuana leading up this kind of group of artists. And then President Jerry Adams, he he was hanging around the scaffolding all the time. He was like chit chatting with the whole team. It was like. And then we would have, at that time, we would have the English with big weapons just, you know, uh, pointing at us at all times, these armored vehicles all the time. It's just really uh, interesting experience. How, how interesting. Uh, could you speak a little bit about your activism as it relates to, uh, to Chicano Park? Well, you know, my Chicanismo, um, actually happened when I came back from Tijuana and went back to East LA. And so I was already now a Mexican because I had been, you know, went through all of elementary school and uh, started going to secundaria. But uh, there wasn't enough space. So I, I told my mom, I'm going to go on my own back to LA. And uh, so I know quite, I knew quite a bit of Mexican history, you know, schools, when I was going to elementary school was was really uh, huge. And uh, they taught us everything about our indigenous uh, heritage, our heroes, heroines. And so when I went back, I start, kept on seeing the racism that was going on in Montebello. I went to Montebello, mostly Raza, and they were saying, you know, you know, different things from not letting us speak Spanish to saying derogatory things about Mexico. And I was always, like in the defense of Mexico and correcting them and things like that. And uh, so my attitude was, was very much uh, in the Chicano realm. So um, the Chicano movement and, and, a lot of, and the Chicano art movement was very important to me along with all these other movements that were going on. Women's liberation, I remember uh, we were very much part of, we were part of anti-war Vietnam uh, war movements, um, the black uh, movements. Uh, so all of these things, I always uh, call it a big tsunami, a big wave. And I, I really did, you know, I never really surfed, but I felt like a surfer in this big, big giant tsunami of movements. It was like all these different movements. And uh, it, that again, that was really great. So when, when the question of building a police uh, parking lot under the bridge. And we had already been going to some of the meetings in Logan Heights about the park, a park for the community um, that, you know, I was going to San Diego State. I was uh, at that time saw a Stetner flyer from, from City College saying they, they're, they're trying to build a, a, a police parking lot. And so we jetted down there and uh, it was already, I remember already over 200 people there and uh, they were already uh, stopped the construction. They, they surrounded the bulldozers with human chains, most, uh, mostly mothers and kids. So when the university students came in, we would like this other thing. And I, I uh, immediately hung around because some senoras came over with big pots of rice and beans and put them on tables. And I said, you know, I was kind of like still in my hippie mode. I always carried a sleeping bag, used to go to concerts a lot. So I said, hey, I'm staying here. We're, 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 we're going to camp out here. And, um, and so that was my initial experience with the development of the park. But um, I became part, a member of the steering committee and for the past 50 years, I've been sort of a coordinator with the murals. I'm sort of a technician with paints and materials because I worked at a silk screen shop. I, I used to paint cars with my dad. Um, so I know all the different kinds of chemicals and, uh, and I know how to mix colors. I can, any color that you, you give me, I can mix it up like a omelet, like an egg omelet. <laughs> That's that, that that's that's so so interesting of a uh, uh, awesome of what the experience as far as history is concerned. Uh, that's more or less around the time that I start getting involved myself, and 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 uh, brings back a lot of memories as far as 
every memory that I have, you 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 probably part of it in a sense because you you're you're one of the muralists that that has probably more murals in Chicano Park to to, to date. And it, it's and true. It, it's been documented that way, and um, not necessarily when I paint a mural, I don't just do a Victor Ochoa mural. I I work with the community, with student groups, uh, community groups, issue oriented. Uh, murals like the one that I'm working on right now and um, you know it uh, and I've been around Flista in a certain way because I mean I my dad loved cars I remember the Merc and even a 38 Ford that he had before that a black one it was that you know really <laughs> that slope in the back I always remember that and I've included cars in my artwork uh, so I, I remember you uh, as we were doing some marches, I remember there was always cars like following us. They were kind of like uh, vehicles in case uh, uh, elder had to, to rest. They, you, you guys would give them a ride. You know, um, they, there were solidarity in the community. And I always saw, you know, cars, you know, here we are in California, the cars were always around us. You know? Definitely good memories. Uh, a question that I have for you is in regards to your relationship with uh, with VIA International, who's uh, hosting us here. Uh, throughout the years, we've worked together with uh, visiting visiting students from all over the country. You want to talk a little bit about that experience? Well, it's been very interesting. I remember Rocky, for instance, and yourself, um, and the project with uh, the women in Tijuana, the outlying uh, areas of Tijuana, and. Uh, I remember first visiting and uh, there was a truck giving out groceries and uh, and then there was another truck giving out uh, clothing and there was some young men there they're just taking their shirts off and throwing them off and then getting a new shirt and I was saying Rocky what what why are they doing that I said well and it it, it seemed very weird that that it was kind of like a drug so if you know that they're giving you stuff you know, you kind of like count on that. And so we want to break away from that attitude. We want to teach them other things about themselves, their self-esteem, and also self-sufficiency. So right away, I plugged into the gardening part of teaching uh, uh, women how to plant uh, a self-sustaining garden. I remember I have an artwork that uh, I still preserve. We, we did an installation that rotated around different areas of, of Tijuana. I love that part of the taping. Uh, every, everybody was recording each other's story, the other women, and then they never used a, ta a cassette tape recorder or a computer, so they learned how to transcribe the tapes to the computer, and the book that was formed from all of those stories was really, really interesting because they started realizing that their, their stories were very similar, that they had husbands that had left to the United States or, you know, it, it was like different things that were, they go, oh, you, your husband did that, your kids are involved in that, you know. It, it was, uh, you know, one of the best self-esteem projects that I've been involved with. And uh, so it was just beautiful to, to deal with. And, and I even went to Canada with uh, women from Central America in, in Mexico, that up in Vancouver, um, and working with a lot of different uh, groups here in San Diego. So I, throughout these years, and I, and I can sort of not remember all the way that far back, but uh, it's always been a very dynamic uh, experience. Currently, uh, with the students that are coming from almost every state of the United States. Uh, we started working in Tijuana, doing things in Tijuana, but to do uh, kind of public art uh, experiences with them, I started getting them to restore some of the older murals. And that always got them so motivated because I would explain to them that we were working with paints that had a, at least a 20 year durability. So they felt like, oh, here, I can express myself to a certain point, and it will be there. It won't be like graffiti that, that will get, uh, you know, uh, erased uh, 
quickly it, that it was going to be preserved there for for years that's always been a really great experience to to deal with all these different students and to see how many uh, have a lot of similarities to us and, and to, to, to Mexicans, to San Diego, uh, to the barrio, to, um, I don't know, it's just been, you know, like I said, I, I seem like every period of my life, I've had so many great uh, experiences, you know. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, I have uh, more, more questions, but I don't know how we're doing with time, John. Are, are, we, are we okay still? Yeah, no, this is great. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, I'll lift uh, one up and encourage other people if they want to drop a question into the chat room. But Victor, one question was about the influence of Mexican muralists uh, on your work. Uh, and whether there are any particular uh, Mexican muralists that you've always identified with or that you feel you've brought uh, a special uh, flavor uh, and feel from that uh, muralist or, or mural tradition into your work at Chicano Park? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think, uh, you know, first of all, my, my mother is Orozco, and eventually I found out that I'm directly related to Jose Clemente Orozco. And that's just, you know, kind of a, my grandfather sort of would insinuate, oh, you're in Orozco, that's why you can paint, you know, and, uh, but as a Chicano, we have this huge heritage of, cave, you know, we have the Mulehe cave painting just 500 miles south of in Baca. We have the pre-Columbian uh, murals, frescoes, the Mayas, the, the Toltecs, the, the Aztecs, that heritage, and then the Mexican muralists that achieved like international renown. So when I started painting murals, I, I felt like and most of us did that we were carrying the torch of this heritage. You know, we were like Chicanos. Now we're, we're on stage and we have, you know, if, if I paint a skeleton, I already know about Jose Guadalupe Posada. So it's got to be either more expressive or on another level. So, we, you know, it's been, you know, our, our skeletons here had San Diego Police Department uh, helmets on them. So we're, <laughs> We're, we're uh, you know, it, it's been a fantastic. I remember touching the wall, the first ramps at Chicano Park, and it was like this genetic energy, you know, that it was just uh, so amazing to, to follow through with all of that influence, you know. And I think still to this day, I, you know, I married somebody that was 20 years younger than me, and I'm also kind of overweight like Diego Rivera. So a lot of people would say, oh, you, you guys are kind of like, Diego and Frida kind of a thing. And we actually uh, won a uh, costume contest and she did, all she did is put some flowers in her hair and, and huh. uh, drew a little bit of uh, eyebrow. And we won, the, we won the contest, you know, <laughs> hands down. <laughs> you know, Victor, it occurs to me there may be some people on the call who, who don't know your work or are not as familiar with your work. And I'm just wondering, I, I, I just wonder, is this an image from, uh, of yours from uh, Chicano Park? I'm going to share my screen. Um, but I'm also, if, if not this one, maybe there's a particular uh, mural that you would uh, want to describe uh, and well, or... Most uh, of the images that I think you have are, are mine or that I worked with um, on there. That's a good idea because I know that I always get a little bit bored just seeing people's heads, you know, but uh, that, that's... Is this is this one of yours? I, oh, I, that, that's the one that I painted in front of the Centro Cultural. Uh, that's Geronimo, who is a, a Apache, and my father was Yaqui, so I felt solidarity with the Apaches. And then I did every discipline that we were working and developing at the center, from Aztec dance to to the senior center, center uh, Rondaya, the musical seniors. That skeleton is reminiscent. There was a skeleton painted on there before. So she's kind of like, you know, jucando, as we say, uh, the Geronimo there. Uh, but that's definitely one of mine. And it's, uh, it's um, a lot of people question, well, why did you do an Apache? I said, well, he, he was at the border. He uh, spoke Spanish and English and Chiricahua. So he was like me. He's like, you know, stand tough at the border. And you say that one's from Central Cultural de la Raza in Balboa yeah, Park. Park. Yeah. yeah. 
And so there was a question about the process of, of, of getting a mural into uh, production and into the public sphere. How do things work at Chicano Park around uh, you know, uh, selection of a mural, of, uh, the, the production of a mural? You mentioned the community involvement process. Tell us a little bit about how a mural actually you know, get, comes, to, comes to, into fruition. Well, I'm, I'm very proud and honored that in the past 50 years, I haven't had any censorship. <laughs> involved in, in in my work at, uh, at in the past 50 years so I, I don't think there's any artist that could say in 50 years nobody said oh you can't do a Che Guevara or you can't do a skeleton you know I, even though Mexicans would come off the freeway and say oh don't paint skeletons because the the well they would say the gringos would would, would not understand they were, they're going to think of you as uh, death uh, oriented or and uh, I always remember my grandmother's um, altars for Day of the Dead. So I had a different idea of that. The, uh, being part of the steering committee, we developed kind of our process. Because in the beginning, we were trying to deal with Caltrans, who now want to keep our copyright. They want, they want us to turn over our copyrights to them. And even at the beginning, they, they gave us so much bureaucratic red tape after six months, I told the rest of the artists, you know what? We're not going to deal with this anymore. We're going to develop our own process. We're not going to have to be screened by any bureaucratic agency. And so ever since um, 73, we just, we went ahead and painted what we wanted to paint or what the community wanted to paint. And then, um, you know, now we required, you know, a sketch, I usually make uh, models of the pillar that uh, we first ask for a pillar that might be available. And then we do a model, scale model, uh, rendering uh, of the mural, and then get the steering committee to approve it. And, and then once that is, then we go and try to raise money, like we're doing with Anastasia right now. It's sort of like after the fact, but we ought to get it. We want to get, we have to finished this mural for his 10th anniversary of his death, so. That, that's um, one of my questions, Victor, excuse me for interrupting. That was probably my last question. I want you to elaborate on that, but I'm quite sure there's other, there's other questions that people have, and I want to save that to, to, towards the end, if you don't mind. Sure, yeah, so we'll close with that uh, invitation to, to talk a little bit about the uh, mural for uh, Anastasio Hernandez Rojas. Uh, Victor, on this series, we've been talking a lot about identity, you know, and, and the, the, the fluid uh, cultural landscape here in, in the borderlands. Uh, we've talked to people who, you know, identify as fronterizos, or you mentioned your upbringing and your identity with the Chicano movements of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, but then you also, uh, when we asked you for a title for this uh, talk, you said uh, Chicano Soras. And I've heard you reference that before. Who is, who is the uh, Chicano Soras? What's the, what's well, the Chicano Soras? It, it was interesting where that came from because in 1984, I, we had the Border Art Workshop. We had a big show at the Galeria de la Raza in the Mission. And Rene Yanez in Paz Descanse uh, saw David Aulos and myself, kind of overweight guys. Everybody in San Francisco seemed to be slim and trim. So we kind of stuck <laughs> out. We kind of stuck out. Uh, and, the, and then he, he called us oh, there comes the Chicano dinosaurs. I kind of got a little bit off balance at first. I didn't know if that was derogatory or not. But then as I thought about it, I said, shit, I'm proud of being a, a Chicano still in 84. And uh, because now in, in the mission, because of the influx of Central American exiles and uh, South Americans, they were starting to use Latino, something that we had never really used here at the border. So I didn't, I still don't like that term. I don't like the term Hispanic. Um, so the, the Chicanosaurus came from that period and I've had people have made cartoons of me. I've, I've wrestled with Super Barrio in a ring as Chicanosaurus and I was actually made a mask of uh, a Chicano dinosaur made made out of a 64 Chevy lowrider, in, in fact, <laughs> and, and, uh, um, and um, it's like, uh, here I am going to be 72 next month, and um, I'm, I feel very hard-headed, 
with all of the issues of Chicanismo. And, and a lot of people, Mexicans think that when we call ourselves Chicanos that we, we're denying that we're Mexicans. We're very proud of being Mexicans. We're very proud of being indigenous people. So it's kind of like the political attitude that we find ourselves here in the United States. <laughs> and I feel when I'm in, in Mexico, I feel I like a Mexicano. When, I, when I'm in the United States, I feel like a US citizen. Uh, both of us are American, by the way. I don't use, I don't call myself an American like uh, most people do. Um, but I feel a both, a both countries and I actually consider myself a border phenomenon because I can just, I have sentry, I zip back and forth. Um, and so, um, like I said, I'm, I feel hard headed into <laughs> that thing. A lot of 72 year olds kind of already kind of lacks that, that brain power that we have. So you're saying the uh, sounds to me like you're saying the natural habitat of the Chicanosaurus is uh, both side, the border wall runs through the natural right. habitat. In honor, we don't we don't really respect that fence going up there. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, this is great. I know Rigo has one uh, one more uh, uh, question uh, that we'll lift up in just a minute. I just want to before we close and and uh, I want to say thank you again to you, Victor. But before we do that, I do want to quickly invite people to visit our Via Cafe. And I'm gonna put it up here on the screen. I'm gonna invite uh, Robert Vivar just to welcome people to the Via Cafe because starting tomorrow, uh, Robert Vivar, uh, part of our team here at Via International, will actually be hosting the Via Cafe, uh, 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, so Robert, do you wanna just uh, give a, a quick word of welcome to people as they uh, may visit the Via Cafe at viacafe.org? I, I, just, I just got a text that somebody can't hear us. I don't know if you could check on that, make sure that- Thank you. Work that our sound is working. Thank you, we'll look into it. That's sure, absolutely, John, thank you very much. Um, and yes, we definitely want to uh, give everybody a, a very warm welcome to join us starting uh, tomorrow, Wednesday. Uh, and uh, we're going to be uh, hosting the cafe live uh, Monday through Friday, eight o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock in the morning, um, providing you with information regarding the different projects that we're offering at uh, via cafe, uh, stop by. Uh, we'd love to chat with you, give you some information or, or just uh, a brief chat uh, as to what uh, is going on here in the border region. Uh, stop by anytime you would like. We'd love to have you uh, visit. Thanks, Robert. And yeah, there's a chat box now that will be live. So you can uh, drop a message anytime and we'll get back to you. But uh, 8 a.m. to 11 a.m., that chat box will be live. And you can chat with Rob, uh, Robert Vivar, our colleague uh, based in Tijuana. Uh, and the, the purpose of the Via Cafe was always to connect across the border, uh, help people connect across the border, and all the projects are related in some fashion with uh, uh, partnerships with our, our friends in, in Tijuana. I also want to just uh, invite you to encourage you to join us for the next couple of uh, Via Voices sessions. Uh, today we were uh, have the pleasure of visiting with uh, Victor Ochoa. Uh, next week is Alexis Dixon, and I'm wondering if Elisa Sabatini, do you want to say a word about your friend Alexis, who you'll be interviewing next Tuesday? Yes, thanks, John. Uh, Alexis has been a friend of mine, personal friend of mine, for more than 20 years. But I'm going to be really excited to speak with him about the work that he has done, more particularly with youth in the community. Um, his ability with processes, I'll call it, for conflict resolution and having young people understand their identity in this time of difference um, I think is remarkable. So I think you'll all enjoy hearing next week from Alexis. That's great, thank you. And then again, uh, next, the following week, July 28th, I'll be interviewing James Brown about his vision for a truly binational park uh, down at Friendship Park on the US-Mexico border between San Diego and Tijuana. So you're welcome to sign up for uh, any, or any, any of those events. And just as a reminder, if you'd like to uh, become a sponsor uh, via Voices, you can do that here on our site. Again, thanks to Kimberly Bayless, Jim Gerber, Sandra Pashal, uh, Elisa Sabatini, and Gloria Sandvik, who have sponsored this series so far. Um, or if you'd like to become a champion and get a weekly email so that you don't have to register for each event, uh, you're welcome to do that uh, To do that also. I do also want to just mention quickly that we are launching Spanish classes through our Escuela Amistad. And if you'd like to join a Spanish language uh, conversation class, our friend uh, based in Tijuana, Dan Watman, is teaching 
uh, Spanish at different levels, and I'll be launching an intermediate class uh, starting this Monday as well. So lots of opportunities to, uh, to connect with people across borders at uh, viacafe.org, uh, and, and uh, thanks, for, thanks as always for your solidarity. Uh, very good. Rigo, do you have a, a final uh, a question for uh, your friend, uh, Victor Ochoa? Yes, definitely, uh, John. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Victor has uh, probably the most murals at Chicano Park, and I want him to touch upon his latest project, the newest projects, the, the new mural that's going to be done at Chicano Park, which is in the process of, uh, of uh, completing now. Uh, Victor, could you tell us about that specific project? Well, I'm, I'm really Sitting excited and in, in really uh, invite all you to come by the plaza area of Chicano Park. Uh, I was actually invited originally by Christian Ramirez uh, over a year ago to do work on this project. And, uh, and uh, it was uh, to dedicate a piece on Anastasio Hernandez Rojas. Uh, so um, at that time, I was uh, starting a, a summer class at Grossmont in airbrushing. And, and so, um, I got a chance to meet the, the widow, uh, Maria Puga, and her, and Anastasio's brothers. And that was very interesting. And, and I, I started thinking about the issues in, in, it, in researching. But when I brought it to my students, I thought it'd be a good idea to do, get them involved in a piece on Anastasio. So we worked on a panel and so at this, I, I always like to get uh, the emotional involvement of the community into the mural. So the same I did with the team uh, as well. So we, I got them to, to speak to Maria at the park. And then is when, when I noticed tears and all the emotional connection that these students had with Maria and the whole discussion of it, it, it hit me even harder because I'm used to dealing with really tough issues, police brutality, Im uh, you know, immigration, uh, bilingual education, uh, knowing knowledge of our indigenous, uh, indigenous uh, heritage. Um, and I kind of digested and I'm kind of used to digesting all of this negative stuff and then trying to pull it out on the mural with something beautiful or uh, significant. So that's how the development of that. And so I got everybody to research and look for images. And uh, every time, the, the panel is amazing. It's at the central and it became even an altar for Day of the Dead. Um, the mural itself becomes, it's a double pillar. And I, I, I send you a picture of it. I don't know if you want to throw it up there. Um, it uh, it kind of looks like you're in a church because it has like a dome feeling to it. And there, you, you see the image of Anastasia looking towards the park and then uh, Maria toward the, to, toward the fountain. And uh, there's actually angels. He's a man that was uh, from San Luis Potosí. He, even the angels have San Luis Potosí uh, garb on, on them. Um, and, uh, you know, he, it um, became, you know, what I can say is a very uh, spiritual, spiritual uh, significance. You could see uh, Anastasia there on the top. But as Chicanos, when we think of uh, an altar for, for Day of the Dead, we've always in incorporated the hybrid cultural heritage that we have of our pre-Columbian ancestors. And so Mitlan in the whole uh, uh, way that we look at at death is a little bit different than the European one. So you do see a Cholo Squinkly up there that's the guide to the afterlife. There's a cell phone there, you see, uh, taking a photograph of the actual murdering of Anastasio, where 12 agents of the immigration kicked, clubbed him, and after he was handcuffed, tased him three times in the cerebrum. And so that illustration will be up there. Uh, although we also have next to that, we have kids that are protesting some of the stuff that is still going on. On the other side, you'll see children that have 
been uh, that have died under immigration custody. Uh, you see that Justicia banner that was flown throughout the past 10 years with his mother and his uh, father and his daughter will be up there. The, the Mexican Eagle also transcends that, uh, you know, that whole uh, thing of transcendence. There's families, there's uh, La Bestia, the train that brings a lot of uh, people to the border. Um, we have, uh, you know, like I said, it's, it's almost a spiritual experience. The whole mural will be painted with pearlescent paints, which is going to make it uh, radiate metallic, almost a glowing, a glowing feeling to it. So it'd be, it is going to be a lot different than most of the murals at Chicano Park. The technology that I'm using is, is uh, the latest uh, technology. It's seven stories high. So I, my knee is hurting me, but actually the doctor said it's getting stronger the more I climb up those stairs. So I have a special scaffolding with stairs and arm rails. <laughs> so I get I climb up those stairs regularly. I think you climbed up there, uh, Rigo, right? Yes, yes, I have. Yes, I have. I, I, have. I like to, I enjoy sending students up there to, to experience okay. that. Definitely. It's, 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 it's an experience just being there, just being there. And, and you're right, I, as, as the newest and probably the largest mural at Chicano Park that's ever, that's ever been do, done there, yeah. I congratulate you and your, and your uh, group and, and your, your uh, team that is helping you develop that. And I know you're, you're, you're the leader of it. And uh, I definitely want to wish you luck. I also want to say thank you for taking the time to, uh, to spend uh, with us and also to educate uh, some of the people that perhaps weren't aware as far as who you are and, and the work that you've done. I know you guys are fundraising well, but there is a link. Uh, for that and we're, we're, you know, just the scaffolding itself, it's uh, $10,000 for the rental. Fortunately, we, we got stalled up for the virus uh, pandemic 70 days where we're, we were on lockdown for 70 days. So it pushed us, uh, you know, at least two months behind schedule. So we're- uh, and am, am I right, Victor, that that's uh, the, the uh, community groups collaborating in that e effort to raise the funds are the American Friends Service Committee and Alliance San Diego. Alliance I got that right? Yeah, very good. Well, well, yes. Uh, will you uh, let me invite you all to join me with just a big round of applause as we give uh, uh, express our appreciation to Victor Ochoa for joining us today. I want to thank uh, again uh, Rigoberto Reyes for interviewing uh, his friend, a longtime friend. Uh, last week, we chatted, uh, Victor, about uh, with Robert Vivar, who described himself as de aquí y de allá. Uh, and we chatted a little bit about that. You know, is it some, some people would say ni de aquí, ni de allá, but uh, maybe it's both and uh, for some. Yeah, no, I, I got it. I'm old enough that I need to feel belonging. I, yeah. I feel, I'm tired of this rejecting part. And people better not be racist with me because I'm 6'1". <laughs> no, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to reveal my weight, but... Uh, I still have my arthritis. Still has uh, karate. Part. Still got some punch. Well, Victor, we really appreciate your being with us today. And again, I want to thank everybody for joining, both uh, here in Zoom and online. Uh, you can visit us at viacafe.org. This uh, interview was live streamed to our Facebook page, by the way, so it'll be up there if you want to go back or share it with a friend. And then we'll be back here next Tuesday, same time, 12 noon on Tuesday. Uh, where Elisa Sabatini will interview her friend Alexis Dixon about uh, conflict resolution. So uh, thanks so much for joining us. Hasta la próxima. And, Thank you uh, for all those people, even the couple that said they were having audio problems. Sorry about that, but it will be live streamed on Facebook. And Yeah, check it out on Facebook. It'll, we'll also put it on our YouTube channel. And, and if you uh, would like to get the links to any of that, just drop us a line. Uh, we'll, get you, we'll get you connected. So very good. Bye, Janice. <laughs> Gracias a todos. Thanks again, Victor. Thank you, Rigo. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good for participar. Hasta la próxima. We'll see you next time.